You may have clicked on this Disfairs episode and wondered, who is this Ollie Johnston and why should I care? Who cares? Well, the answer to that is easy enough. Ollie Johnston influenced not just Disney animation, but the entire art of animation. Now, whereas some great animators got the job done with bold, deliberate moves, Ollie reeled himself in to show that soft, even tender, almost forgettable actions and movements, if timed correctly, left a huge impact on the psyche of an audience. He was a master in subtlety and manipulation through humor, sensitivity, and raw emotion. And if that weren't enough, Ollie Johnston was also the third of Walt's nine old men. He worked from the Mickey cartoons predating Snow White all the way to the Fox and the Hound. Over 40 years of expertise and experience, enough to have co-written The Illusion of Life, which still roundly referred to as the Animator's Bible, which I'll go into more later on in this episode. Ollie Johnston was known for being a really nice guy. Now that's said about a lot of people, so let me stress the point. Ollie Johnston was a really super nice, easygoing guy. He had a nice friendly voice, smiled often, didn't give the impression there was a drop of angst in his disposition. Though it's also said that he could be quite clear about what he disliked about someone's animation work in that very same friendly voice. He was a perceptive guy and worked intuitively, rather than being technical like Milk Call or just merely observational. He once said about himself that he seemed to have a kind of reservoir of feelings about how people felt in certain situations, and yet he didn't believe himself to be a natural artist such as Mark Davis or again like Milk Call, and that's true. However, that didn't stop Ali's animations from continually improving throughout his life, making breakthroughs in his work decades after initially setting down the path of animation as a career. Ali drew very lightly. At times, his lines would disappear and reappear on the paper, described as kissing the paper. And having an extremely light hand, his movements were smooth and fluid. This light style also lent him incredible speed in finishing his work compared to other animators. Speed, I'm speed. Float like a Cadillac, sting like a beamer. His technique was to keep the drawings in his animations as simple as possible, while simultaneously making the appropriate statement with the character. Working simply may sound like a cop-out of sorts, but it's the exact opposite in animation. The simpler the character, the fewer lines involved, the less that's in the way in animating them. It's also a part of the actual art in animation. The idea is not to go for realism, but to narrow the focus to an idolized expression of what something or someone is. Mirroring his personality, there was little to no aggression in Ollie's drawings, and yet everything is assertive and natural. He was unlike any other of Walt's nine, placing his laser focus on pure emotion and depth of character. He also didn't call keyframes keyframes. He instead called them golden drawings, poses that overflowed with clear personality. He essentially decided upon a great frame that could have essentially been used for an illustration all by itself. These golden drawings led other frames in and out to other golden drawings. It's very much just like keyframes, but there's a subtle difference in Ollie's outlook that lent his work a uniqueness. Not only did every golden drawing lead into the next, but they each kind of set up and ushered in the next pose, a string of cohesion. He said finding good key poses are half the battle of good animation, and that each golden drawing is used to strengthen the one that follows. Arcs, timing, and secondary actions convey the weight of emotion, and if done correctly, create rich character. Now, Ollie's origin story began in the then temperance town of Palo Alto, California. He had a laundry list of health issues growing up, to the point that he himself stated it was a wonder he survived. He endured multiple infections, measles, chicken pox, and palsy in his drawing hand, causing it to shake throughout his life and making his job as an animator all the more astounding and challenging. But these ailments in his palsy condition is said to have instilled an inner strength in him during adolescence and an outer gentleness in him as an adult. Fast forward past his childhood and Ali turned out to be a strapping young student at Stanford University, where his father, not so coincidentally, just so happened to be a professor. Ali worked on the campus magazine called Stanford Chaparral, locally known as The Chappie. It's actually America's third oldest running humor magazine, running as far back as 1899. I only focus on this humor magazine because it's where Ali first met the man who would turn out to be his lifelong bestest friend, another of Walt's nine old men, and the other co-author to The Illusion of Life, Frank Thomas. My best friend. 
Their relationship was like so many best friend duos of the big and small screen. Han and Chewie, Timon and Pumbaa, Frodo and Sam, Ron and Harry, Balky and Larry, Mike and Sully, Bill and Ted. That seems like way too many examples, but the exception here is that these two guys were like real people. And both men affirmed that Stanford wasn't a great place for growing young artists. This is Stanford walked in on a class back in 1900 and there was a nude model and she said, never be another nude model or a draped model here at Stanford. So Frank ended up graduating before Ollie and then started to attend the Schoenard Art Institute in Los Angeles. When Stanford went on to play at the Rose Bowl the following New Year's, Ollie visited Frank at the art school and was so amazed at the work being done there that he left Stanford to also take classes at the Schoenard Art Institute. I also brought this school up in the Diz Fair's Mark Davis the Animator episode, by the way. During this era, it was a remarkable art school with a lot of talent, both in terms of students and faculty. Ali claims that though he had drawn since he was a child, it nonetheless didn't come to him naturally. This may sound weird given who Ali Johnston became, but when you look at natural artists like Mark Davis or Milk Call, it makes sense. It took Ali endless amounts of hard work to become a good enough draftsman to become an animator. During these formative years at Schoenard, Ali finally started to master the basics of design and illustration, essentially beginning his ascent to the higher strata of animation that few ever reach. Two professors at Schoenard played a vital role in Ali's development. Don Graham, also mentioned in the Mark Davis episode, and more prominently, Pruitt Carter. Now Carter was renowned for his illustrations displaying tons of emotion and movement. The figures in Pruitt's work had a certain aliveness, and you really get a sense of what his subjects are feeling. When you look at Ollie's work with the hindsight of Pruitt Carter's influence, it's obvious to see how Ollie developed his style. Ollie admitted he was very amateurish when he met Carter, and that Carter was very critical, but he recognized the emotional quality in Ollie's work. Moreover, Pruitt believed Ollie's raw talent in displaying and emitting emotion through his work was worth nourishing and took an active hand in refining that talent over the years they spent together at Schoenard. Frank Thomas, still ahead of Ollie academically, started working for Disney at the Hyperion Studio in 1934. Ollie had yet to think of becoming an animator. He thought he was working toward a career in magazine illustration. Then one day while shaving, for some reason, I seem to get my best ideas while I'm shaving. Frank told Ollie that he got him a tryout at Disney, a tryout being a one-week stint for the studio to determine whether you were worth hiring. Ollie still wasn't sure he even wanted to be an animator. However, Professor Don Graham suggested Ollie try to join Disney's ranks. To no one's particular surprise, Ollie here passed his tryout period and signed up with Disney on January 21st, 1935 for a whopping $17 a week. He said after about three weeks, he decided there was no place else he would ever want to be. Keep in mind, Ollie developed as an animator alongside the golden age of animation. His first job was as a cleanup artist on Mickey's Garden. After that, he was a cleanup artist on Mickey's Rival, where he really shined under lead animator Jerry Geronimi, also known as Clyde. Wilfred Jackson, who'd been with Disney well before Mickey Mouse was even contrived, said that Ollie's cleanups on Mickey's Rival was the best he had ever seen. And yet, Ollie Johnston came to despise Jerry Geronimi, as most people who worked with him apparently did. But that's another saga for another episode. Ollie, however, forever recalled March 23, 1936, the day he was promoted to be Fred Moore's assistant. Um, I keep it taped up to my window to remind me of how great the guy was and how much he meant to me. As an apprentice animator, Ali worked under Fred on several Pluto and Mickey shorts. Fred Moore, who went by Freddy, is given a lot of credit for having refined the look of Disney characters and its animation. Even if you disagree with the claim, you'd have to say Moore, at minimum, lent a heavy influence. He added the cheeks to Mickey and defined the degree of squash and stretch used in Disney feature films. There's no doubt that Moore's style influenced Ali Johnston, whose own work was phenomenally rich and pliable. For his part, Ollie Johnston claimed Freddie Moore was a natural animator, and he taught Ollie and Frank Thomas the ways of animation all during the production of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Freddie was one of several lead animators on the Dwarfs. He's known to have given them their likable charm, stressing both staging and expression. 
more than stressing, insisting that you can't properly show expression without good staging. Ollie Johnston wasn't only Freddy's assistant on the project, but had been elevated to the head assistant on all of the dwarfs. The position was not easy for Ollie, not that anyone would have had an easy go of it, just as Mark Davis had to compromise and unify very different stylized drawings of the Snow White character, Ollie Johnston had to wrangle the same balance for the dwarfs between Freddie Moore, Bill Titla, Frank Thomas to a small degree, Dick Lundy, Les Clark, and Fred Spencer. The disagreements involved weren't dramatic, but you can imagine the differences of opinion between such creative minds, all with Ollie Johnston spinning about in the middle like Ishmael after the devastation of Moby Dick. The fundamental principle Ollie would later preach to younger artists as an older man was to animate feelings, not drawings. Taking what Freddie Moore professed to heart, Ollie believed that focusing on any given character's emotions is what breathed life into characters and made them believable. The way he saw it, no two characters would ever perform a similar action the same way, and even the same character had different approaches to an action given their mental and emotional state. An excellent example of this are all seven dwarves. It would have been easy to animate them all the same, but even when you're not paying attention, they each have their own unique way of doing something, even when it's not the focus in the scene. This subtlety, in part, is what made Snow White so great, and set the standard of animation moving forward. After Snow White was completed, Freddie Moore had a sidebar with Walt about Ollie, telling him that Ollie was ready to be a lead animator. However, Ollie didn't start off on any star characters. He was instead placed as the lead artist on the crowds in The Brave Little Tailor. Ollie poured as much character as he could into all of the individuals. He admits to having made a lot of mistakes, characters moving too fast and such, but he learned to control and slow it down as the project wore on. Later in life, he said the work was nothing to write home about, but at the time, he was so excited he was ready to burst, and you could see it reflected in the work itself. Ali also got the chance to animate some of Mickey Mouse in the scenes where he battles the giant, so even though the brave little tailor isn't talked about much today, it's definitely worth going back and checking out. I think I've seen it about four dozen times myself, before even learning about Ali's involvement. Walt Disney felt Ollie Johnston did so well on The Brave Little Tailor that he decided to place Ollie as a directing and lead animator on the character of Pinocchio, along with Frank Thomas, and for a time, Freddie Moore. So this was the first time Ollie Johnston was an animator on a feature, and the pressure was on. The world was wondering if Disney could follow up on the success of Snow White. Whether or not the Disney studio succeeded in this is still a big multifaceted debate. But the point here is, Ollie Johnston stepped up to the challenges, and from then on was a name to be recognized in animation history. Right from the start, Ollie was using secondary actions to give more to audiences. He gave the puppet a lot of little gestures that you really don't think about. Real little gestures that someone would have. Animation up to this point hadn't gone this deep into the outward expression of a character's psyche. It's not intended to draw your attention, but rather to draw you in to believing the character is real as opposed to a series of drawings. Which, even after Snow White, believability was still a concern amongst many people. These subtle movements are in both of Ollie's scenes in Pinocchio. Two scenes, by the way, which were pivotal in the feature. Ali animated the scene when Pinocchio comes to life, which was thought of as a bit of a problem beforehand by many at the studio. Ali played it off as though Pinocchio was simply waking up, which still plays fairly well decades after the fact. He also animated the emotional and wide-ranging scene where Pinocchio is locked in the birdcage. The movement of the cage, Pinocchio, the tears, worry, joy in seeing Jiminy, it's a gamut of different feelings. This, of course, leads right into the sequence where Pinocchio lies to the Blue Fairy. The first scene, Ali really let loose his talent with emotion. He grew much better with time, but this scene was nevertheless the culmination of everything he learned at the Show Renard Institute, down to his tutelage under Freddie Moore. There's complex interplay of fear, anxiousness, excitement, and getting away with his lies, and confusion. A phenomenal use of timing, subtlety, and sincereness. Uh, through his lies. But not bad for a beginner, huh? After Ollie worked out some of his kinks on Pinocchio, he helped animate the pastoral symphony segment in Fantasia. He worked on the centaurettes. That's what they're actually called, centaurettes. As well as the cupids. These centaurettes were basically a centaur extension of Freddie Moore's own personal style of drawing. So it's no wonder that Freddie Moore and Ollie Johnston worked alongside one another on this. 
The fact that everything had to be pantomimed was a major hurdle for them. However, for his share of the load, Ali was more than up to the challenge and was very successful in conveying the thoughts and expressions of the Cupids and Centaurettes. The work on Fantasia wasn't a huge breakthrough moment for animation, but it was a big point in Ali's life nonetheless, because it was when he began to date Mary Worthy, who worked in the ink and paint department at Disney. The two consequently got married several years later, a story much like Walt and Lillian Disney, or Mark and Alice Davis. It seems the more I research, the more interpersonnel Disney employee marriages I learn about, at least among the higher-end talented elite. She's the one, the lucky girl I'm going to marry. But anyways, Ali played such a pivotal role in the animation of Bambi that he literally wrote the book on it nearly five decades after its release. Bambi was an ambitious feature to say the least. Probably the most ambitious animation ever attempted. Mostly regarded by those who've worked in animation, but not so much by audiences over the years. The sheer amount of emotion that needed to be expressed in animals, as well as the skill to animate the movement of realistic forest animals, was not in the purview of many animators. That goes for present day, and even more so in the 1930s and 40s. There were four supervising animators for the entire film. Frank Thomas, Milt Kahl, Eric Larson, and Ollie Johnston. Ollie worked on the characters of Bambi and Thumper. He did the erratic, hilarious, and excruciatingly difficult animation on Bambi learning to walk. He also animated the complex, emotional, and quite humorous scene of Thumper meeting Bambi for the first time, a segment that required precise acting and movement. Kinda wobbly, isn't he? And after watching Ollie's work in chronological order, I really believe it was here that he started to truly animate wholly from the feelings the characters were experiencing, rather than just animating a performance. If this wasn't enough, which it was, he also animated the scene where Bambi meets Feline. The energy, vibrancy, and crispness in this segment just can't be found today. It doesn't matter if it's 2D or 3D, there's just no one hitting this level of timing and talent. Bambi's chance meeting with the Great Stag was also done by Ollie, and he animated the older Bambi in the later part of the feature. All of Ollie's scenes in Bambi portrayed a vast array of complicated emotions, subtle cues, and unbelievable sincerity. It remains the prime example of how to mix realism and emotion in animation. It didn't seem to matter one bit that he was greener than the other supervising animators on Bambi. Ali was undoubtedly successful in getting audiences to connect with the characters in his scenes. I understand that not many people are going to go back and re-watch Bambi, but anyone that has any interest in animation has to go back to this feature. It's nearly a hundred years now, and it still sets the bar for how animal animation is done. There have been other animations that worked in the same vein, such as Spirit, focusing on the animation of horses, but Bambi still reigns as the powerhouse for overall animal animation. That's the good stuff. I don't want to dive into the politics of World War II, but suffice it to say that it caused a serious stagnation to the art of animation at Disney, and therefore the world over. But interestingly, Ollie actually tried to enlist to join the war effort alongside Frank Thomas in the animation unit. Frank had already once served and had re-enlisted, so he wasn't just a national treasure as an artist, but an American hero too. However, because of the palsy Ollie suffered, he was rejected from enlisting, so he stayed behind, working away in the much quieter offices of the Burbank studio. The animation projects became smaller in scope, were put on smaller budgets, the studio was a much emptier place. Money, which was always a concern, became an even bigger consideration. But, Ollie Johnston was given busy work projects during this era. At least that's how he viewed it. The first of these projects was Reason and Emotion, which was actually pretty good for its 8 minute duration. Ollie only did a small segment, but it was the definite best and most interesting scene. Surprisingly, he was put on the female character of Emotion, who was the most bold, defiant, and animated character Ollie had ever handled. The energy of the female emotion character just wasn't his style, and he likely wouldn't have been handed this project if there were other animators to choose from. The range, wildness, and over-the-top behavior just wasn't what Ali was known for, and yet he did an incredible job. No one was more surprised than himself at how much he enjoyed animating her. Really, it's one of those scenes that draws you in and makes you forget where you are kind of animations. You heard me, a club sandwich with potato salad. But I insist, tea and tea. A poor Decker club sandwich with cheese and ham and two. The next two years for Ollie were the Three Caballeros, Victory Through Air Power, Chicken Little, and the Pelican and the Snipe. 
He wasn't particularly excited about any of these, save for animating Donald Duck and the Three Caballeros. But then, according to Ollie Johnston, he was having trouble with the inexperienced in-betweeners the studio had hired during this time. If you're at all familiar with Disney's Peter and the Wolf, it shouldn't be too surprising to hear that Ollie animated the character of Peter, an innocent, good-natured kid with a toy gun who wants nothing more than to prove himself, only to be entangled in a deadly struggle with a wolf. It has a very classic style of animation with a heart-filled, triumphant story. It doesn't have the high-end Disney feature appeal, but it's still a strong piece and was originally released with Make Mine Music, which was a collection of different musical animations brought together for a single feature. These packaged animations didn't really take off, but kept the studio going through the war. But Peter and the Wolf was pretty solid, in no small part due to Ollie's work on Peter. You really believe in Peter's reactions and feelings. In spite of the artistic style, audiences still get the sense that the boy is really going through the highs and lows of the story. And yet with no dialogue to speak of, so to speak, right from the get-go until the end, there's a defined sense of character to Peter that conveys who he is, inside and out. Again, through zero use of dialogue. Its subtlety is staggering. Ali, like all the great animators of the day who were still at the studio during the war, worked on Song of the South, a live-action slash animated feature that had the worst possible sort of script. Namely, it was racist. Which was an unintended consequence after hiring the wrong scriptwriter, but that's for another episode. Despite its glaringly flawed theme, it was loaded with only the best animators of the day, six of whom were of Walt's nine old men. The 36 animators on it pretty much all said they had a great time working on it. The reason for which isn't at all surprising. Being so restricted by budgets, truncated projects, and poorly constructed teams for half a decade, the looseness of the vibrant characters in Song of the South was like unleashing a pack of pent-up dogs. These animators finally had a project they could sink their teeth into and work on good, solid character animation. Okay, so Ollie was a directing animator on Song of the South. He animated several segments of Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Bear. It's a little rough to say what scenes anyone actually worked on because there's so little information about the feature due to its unfortunate content. But I was able to find a few of Ollie's animation frames when Br'er Rabbit pleads for his life, so I believe this one was his. And Disney's own documentaries from 40 years ago played these scenes when speaking about Ollie Johnston, so I can only assume they were also his. So in the morning you start out with all these hot ideas, talk them over, and then coming home you'd be talking about, geez, I don't know, this sure didn't work out well. But as fun as Song of the South may have been to work on, it was only a brief reprieve from the segmented shorts the animators found themselves back on right afterward. Next up for Ollie was animating Little Toot in Melody Time, another package feature comprised of different musical segments. Then Ollie found himself animating all of the District Attorney and Mr. Toad, which Ollie was very proud of. He admitted that the attorney didn't have much screen time, but he was pleased to have a character entirely to himself without having to share any credit. The theatrics, sharp movements, and intense energy was not exactly Ollie's style but it again highlights that he could successfully work outside of his comfortable wheelhouse. It's said that this fun character, by the way, was much desired and sought after, aggressively so, by Milk Call. But that's never been confirmed, it's just speculation, though it completely jives with Milk Call's abrasiveness. Right after the district attorney, Ali animated Ichabod in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He did the scene where Ichabod is giving the music lesson, as well as when he receives the flower from Katrina. He also animated some of the villain Brom Bones, particularly during his and Ichabod's so-called fight scene. And he animated the scene where Ichabod peppers and peppers and peppers an egg until he chokes. Is that what's happening here? <laughs> With World War II finally over in 1945, things over at Disney quickly got back on track. However, because animated features take so much time to create, the world didn't know that until 1950. But by the spring of 1946, Disney's Cinderella was in full swing. All nine of Walt's nine old men worked on Cinderella. However, Ollie Johnston didn't work on the character of Cinderella. He instead did a fantastic job of animating both of the Wicked Stepsisters, Anastasia and Drizella. These were Ollie's first villains, and as you can imagine, if you haven't seen the movie recently, they're hilarious and entertaining to watch. His comedic timing was entirely spot on. The pair have a wide assortment of humorous postures, gestures, and expressions to go along with the excellent voice work. They're seriously fun to hate. 
Oh, and Ollie also animated the King's Lackey here and there, the Grand Duke. Milk Kahl animated a lot of them, so it's tough to say which scenes belong to Ollie. I believe it was here with Anastasia and Drizella that he really began to take his and his mentor, Pruitt Carter's, philosophy to heart, and truly began to not draw what the character was doing, but draw what the character was thinking, which, for two characters that aren't too bright, their intentions and thought patterns are more than apparent. Oh, well, uh, it, it may be a trifle snug today. Alice in Wonderland was a feature that all of Walt's nine old men worked on, and Ollie got to be one of the directing animators for the character of Alice. Ollie's most prominent work was animating the Alice in the Doorknob scene, a complex, busy segment with a lot of ups and downs. However, I want to add that animators didn't particularly like working on Alice, Ollie Johnson included. Nobody, including Walt Disney, felt she had any heart or real conviction. I'm paraphrasing here, but Mark Davis said she was essentially a nice girl facing one nut after another. The character of Alice gave animators little to nothing to work with. Walt blamed the animators, the animators blamed the story and or character design, but I feel Ollie sort of pegged it when he said he guessed it must have been everybody's fault. And kind of a side note, but Ollie also animated most of the King of Hearts. Defined as a passive figure, it would have been easy for the King to be forgettable, but well, yeah, he's still pretty forgettable. Ollie did do a great job, though. This guy was supposed to be forgettable, right? The next project Ollie Johnston worked on was a complete 180 from Alice, however. He absolutely shined in animating Mr. Smee and Peter Pan. You see what I mean about him continually evolving? He was roundly praised for his work on the character, and Mr. Smee wasn't necessarily a big character in the feature, yet he always sticks in the minds of those who see it. It's an enormous testament to his work. Ollie said Smee was one of the most difficult characters he ever worked on, primarily because Ollie's style of animating was to focus on the character's feelings, but Smee was not a guy who thought very deeply. What you're watching is essentially a very deep feeling animator animating a base surface level character, which I think is why Smee, if animated by anyone else, would have been a more forgettable figure. But despite being a villain, you sense an underlying heart within Smee, and at the same time understand that there's not a lot going on behind that particular curtain, as is perfectly reflected in his uncoordinated walk. He's really a multi-tiered character that's both shallow and yet unfathomable, and yet when anyone looks at him as an overall package, he's extremely interesting. Moreover, Ollie's best friend, Frank Thomas, animated Captain Hook, so they shared scenes together. Seeing as how Captain Hook is a headliner, Frank Thomas typically laid out and animated the scenes where the pair are together first, but Ollie is said to have taken total control over Smee when animating him with Hook within Frank's staging. The two of them always worked well together, and with each project they ascended to a higher and unprecedented level of talent and skill. But in the end, the water balloon shaped Smee was a mere highlight in Ollie's career, firmly proving himself capable of animating comic relief. And when it was over, it was just another job well done by Ollie Johnston. Well, Captain, it's nice to see you smiling again. <laughs> Once done with Smee, Ollie was on to animating Susie and Susie the Little Blue Coop, which, in a delightful sort of way, was pretty much a prequel to Pixar's Cars film some 50 years beforehand, given the extremely familiar anthropomorphizing of the cars. Ollie put a lot of character and pep into Susie, but the animation doesn't look as loose as his other work at least not until the final segment. I don't know if that's due to her being a car and him not exactly knowing how much squash and stretch he can get away with, or some other practical reason such as time restraints. Either way, it's an entertaining short with a lot of heart. Then it was on to Ben and Me, which is an animation that had a ton of big Disney names working on it. Les Clark, Hamilton Lusk, Wooly Reitherman, John Lounsbury, Claude Coates, and it's nearly impossible to sit through today. It is, I'm sorry, it's just boring. It really is, it's not good. Although the animation of Ben Franklin was excellent, done by none other than Ollie Johnston. He did his job, I don't know what those other guys were doing, or the writing on this one. After Ben and Me, Ollie was made a directing animator for Lady, Jacques, and Trusty on Lady and the Tramp. And this turned out to be a serious turning point for Ollie. There was a change in his work, Instead of round, fun circles, he harnessed his focus into the relationships between characters, as well as even more refined subtleties. These traits in his work suddenly became his hallmarks. 
The believability became stronger. The performances took on a dramatic weight. He had elevated to another new plateau. Finally and thoroughly coming to understand the indescribable magic that takes place between two characters simply touching. Whereas, say, Mark Davis's area of expertise was animating women, animating relationships became Ollie Johnston's forte over the course of Lady and the Tramp. His work on Lady is said to have immediately drawn in audiences to embrace the character. However, the work he did on the feature was greatly overshadowed by Frank Thomas, and for good reason. Frank Thomas did historically amazing work on Lady and the Tramp. Milk Call, too. For some reason, this feature was a turning point for the betterment of animation. All of the heavy-hitting animators were upping their game, and yet also refining their unique personal strengths as artists. It must have been an exciting time. The animation for Lady and the Tramp carries a certain charm, the story gradually fleshing out an entire world around the main characters in a way that wasn't quite done before. That being said, it's again hard to determine which scenes of Lady Ali is responsible for. Other animators played larger roles, and Ollie's talents were significantly divided into other characters, so his credit for her performances is sorely fractionated. That's what he gets for being so amazing, I guess. After Lady and the Tramp, both Ollie and Frank worked together, side by side, in developing the three fairies for Sleeping Beauty, Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather. A project which actually ended up taking painstaking years to develop, both in pre-production and animation production. The teamwork between these two heavyweight artists is directly reflected in the three fairies, if that math makes any sense. In case you don't recall or never saw Sleeping Beauty, it was a tricky feature. The backgrounds were exceptional, however, it's been argued that as good as the character design and animation was, there was just no way for them to aesthetically blend the characters with the backgrounds. The exception to this was perhaps the three fairies. Walt had originally wanted the three fairies to have the same sort of personality, akin to Huey, Dewey, and Louie during that time. But Ollie felt that wouldn't have been very fun at all, and felt the feature would have been richer if they each had their own set personality. Each of the fairies took time to develop. They were each honed, hewn, and carved into their respective characters, and each is distinct from the other two, yet has their place in any given situation without the need of explanation. It's because the three characters understand their relationships so well that the audience intuitively grasps those relationships without the need of explanation or backstory. Such on-screen chemistry between animated characters doesn't come without a lot of pre-thought and precise execution. And yet, it's easy for an audience to take it for granted because the chemistry between the right live actors comes so fluid and easily. The character of Fauna in particular was tricky for Ollie and Frank to iron out. She was ultimately derived from a woman the two of them met while their families vacation together in Colorado. It's cool, right? These two best pals even vacation together. Their families had homes right next door to each other too, but I don't want to detract too far off point here. They described this character-inspiring woman they met on vacation as a wispy, constantly smiling, twinkly-eyed, almost unaware of what might be going on around her sort of woman. She could scarcely believe in wrongdoing and delighted in spreading what she considered sunshine. Sprinkle in the voice of Billy Burke, and you've got Fauna. Mark Davis, the so-called ladies' man because of how great he was at animating female characters, actually helped by designing some fashion ideas for the Flora Merriweather dress scene. Mark Davis's wife, Alice Davis, was a fashion designer, mind you, and even as willful and talented as she was, deferred to Mark's artistic principles. But beside all of that, Ollie ended up merely combining both of Mark's ideas into something new and better, again, just casually being amazing. As great as the character development and animation was on the fairies, Ollie Johnston was still personally dissatisfied with the final product. He felt the relationship of each fairy with Aurora should have been stronger and more pronounced, much like the way Snow White has a slightly different relationship with each of the dwarfs. He lamented that Aurora viewed Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather as essentially the same personality. And he's correct, he really is. It's still a great feature in spite of the oversight, but I get how frustrating for him it must have been after taking so many years to create the relationships and characters, only to gape at the single glaring flaw that remained. Now look what you've done! But the best way to get over a lament is to move on to something new, which Ali did after being put on 101 Dalmatians. After being regaled for his touching dog moments in Lady and the Tramp, it's pretty obvious to understand why he was placed on the character of Pongo and Perdita. A name that sounds way too close to her master, Anita, by the way. 
And as though we weren't busy enough, Ollie also animated the nanny. If Ollie learned how impactful touching can be in Lady and the Tramp, he mastered it in 101 Dalmatians. This feature was yet another turning point in his work. It's evident when Nanny embraces Pongo after the puppies are born, and when Pongo kisses Perdita after she confesses of being frightened of Cruella. Ollie once explained that the most difficult expression in animation was love. He also said there's not one definitive motion or movement that does it, that it takes multiple small, subtle gestures to get it across, and that oftentimes, an audience can't exactly place when they learned when one character loves another, but that they gradually develop it as a fact. I really wonder what Ollie could have accomplished with this newfound understanding of animating love between two characters, but it never happened. Not in a romantic sense, anyway. Which there was not a shred of in Ollie's next project on the Sword in the Stone. Ollie was pretty busy on the feature. He animated several scenes between Merlin and Wart, as well as most of Archimedes. It may seem hard to believe, but this feature was still made during the golden age of animation. There were problems going on at the studio. Some were even arguing for all production on animated features to cease. There was just a lot of focus and money being poured into Disneyland, and though the world didn't know it, save for a very select few of individuals at the time, the Disney World project had already taken steps toward construction. But the Sword in the Stone, despite its lacking story problems, was still done by some of history's best animators, one of which just so happened to be Ollie Johnston. And I had no idea about this until just recently, but Ollie Johnston, as well as Frank Thomas, also worked on the Penguins and Mary Poppins. Ollie animated most of the introduction scenes, while Frank worked more on the dance with Dick Van Dyke. The animation director was Hamilton Lusk, a former animator himself. You may recall, I mentioned him earlier. The Penguin designs were, of course, refined by Milt Cobb, which is why I suppose the scene has always worked so well. Some of the best Disney talent ever had put it all together. After the Sword in the Stone underperformed commercially, Walt decided his next animated feature story would be driven by strong character relationships and have a decent budget. The stage was perfectly set for Ollie Johnston. The feature would be The Jungle Book. You better believe it. Both Frank and Ollie were responsible for creating and animating the dynamic relationship between Baloo and Mowgli, perhaps the strongest relationship in animation ever. Possibly ever anyway. Together, they animated nearly all of the pair's scenes, retaining a fantastic consistency in the two characters. Ollie was careful to build their relationship slowly. The contact between the two characters was done subtly, gradually forming the bond between them so the audience understands it as an undeniable fact, despite it never being spoken aloud. Ollie was also the directing animator of Bagheera, whose inspiration was driven by a man at the Burbank studio who kept a very tidy office who happened to work near another man who kept a very messy office. The names were never released, but you get the idea they sort of had an odd couple kind of thing going. I've suspected it was Mark Davis and Mill Call, but who knows? Anyway, the two very differing men were the basis for Bagheera and Baloo. Ali initially had personal misgivings about the ending of The Jungle Book. He had trouble getting past the bittersweet moment when Mowgli follows the girl into the man village. He admitted to wrestling with it for some time, but the more he wrestled with it, the more he liked the final approach. He supposed having Mowgli being innocently seduced was the best ending after all. The Jungle Book was the last animated feature Walt Disney oversaw before passing away in 1966. In the wake of his absence, Ollie Johnston, as well as practically every other talented artist at Disney, felt the quality of the work at the studio suffered. Ollie personally felt as though the good days were behind the studio. The feeling on this proved to be true, if only temporarily. And by temporarily, I mean decades. There's no denying the passing of Walt Disney very much afflicted the overall art of animation. And I guess it makes perfect sense. No single individual had done as much for animation than Walt Disney. Ollie Johnston and Milk Call shared Thomas O'Malley and Duchess in the Aristocats, the two main characters. So it was a situation just like when Ollie and Frank shared the two leads in The Jungle Book. This time, however, with Milt Call, things did not run anywhere near so smoothly. Ollie and Milt had worked together perfectly fine in the past, but not so on this go-around. Milt believed himself to be the best of all animators, known for also being outspoken, egotistical, and even outright abusive to those he felt weren't pulling their weight. Don't hate the guy based just on this. He really backed up this rude behavior with a lot of talent. 
Anyway, mean old Milk Carl turned his ire on soft-spoken good guy Ollie. It wasn't just Ollie, though. Milt was vocal about his belief that most people working on the Aristocats were lazy b****. I won't use the actual word because I know certain families with kids are watching. But you can imagine what he said to Ollie. He called him lazy. When you consider Milt's side of things, the resentment toward the flailing scripts while knowing he was at the height of his animating talent, eh, you can understand his reasons for his ragey behavior, even if you can't condone it. Some of this angst was justified, some of it was not. Either way, it was undignified and quintessentially Milk Call, who is the next of Walt's nine old men, by the way. For his part, Ali once publicly stated that Milt only animated what was on the storyboards, a reference to the fact that Milt's characters didn't possess anywhere near the feelings or complexities of character found in Ali's work. But all of that aside, this angst between Ollie Johnston and Milt Call, unfortunately, went on until the end of their animation careers, and had some dire consequences to the art of animation, which I'll go over in just a bit. And just an FYI, Ollie also animated the Geese, Amelia, Abigail, and Uncle Waldo, with Frank Thomas on the Aristocats. <laughs> Ollie didn't believe the story for Robin Hood was very good, and I can't blame him. That particular script is a story unto itself, but that didn't stop Ollie from doing the best job he could on the project. He was the lead animator for Prince John and Sir Hiss in Robin Hood. Huh? Those were like the two best characters, standing out perhaps even more than the title character of Robin Hood. Ollie said he would practically ogle Peter Ustinov, the voice of King John, and Terry Thomas, the voice of Sir Hiss, whenever he had lunch with them. Looking for little movements and quirks, he said he wouldn't take his eyes off them because he thought he would see something he could use. Ustinov in particular would catch this, become a bit unnerved, and peek back at Ali out of the top of his eyes, apparently never directly commenting on the uncomfortableness of the situation. Ali actually refined the storyboards of his scenes before working on the animation, so he's highly lauded for the staging of the Prince John and Sir His scenes. Furthermore, he went on to say that Ustinov didn't move around much, and so Ali's conception of Prince John hardly moved because he's really too lazy. So he's simply a character jam-packed with gestures. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The Rescuers was the last animation Ali worked from start to finish, and it had more heart than anything he'd done in nearly a decade. He was a lead animator on Penny, Rufus, and Orville. The scenes with Penny and Rufus are so tender, and again, filled with such subtlety that it almost makes up for the utterly disenchanting story. Much to what Milk Kyle said, this era at Disney had the best animators at the height of their talent, working from uninteresting and lackluster scripts. Despite all of its flaws, Ali said he did enjoy working on his characters. And Ali was caricatured as the character Rufus, which was just one of his animated cameos. I'll get to the others in just a moment. The last feature Ollie Johnston worked on was Fox and the Hound, which, inconsequently, was the only Disney feature Tim Burton worked on as an animator, admittedly stating he was terrible at drawing fox legs, which, you know, it's just sometimes fun to imagine an older Ollie Johnston, veteran animation hero, coolly toiling away in his office, while somewhere nearby was a frustrated young Burton trying his best to hammer out in between frames. Ali did some scenes with the younger versions of Todd and Copper, as well as Chief, Vixie, and older Todd. With most of their friends having moved on from Disney, dissatisfied in the features they were working on, the palsy in Ali's hand growing worse now that he was in his later years, both Ali Johnston and Frank Thomas decided to retire on January 31st, 1978. Randy Cartwright took over Ali's job as supervising animator on The Fox and the Hound, and the pair stepped well, they didn't go anywhere. They continued to stay in their offices at the Burbank studio for the next five years and wrote what's termed, as I said, the Animation Bible. The name of this very heavy book is The Illusion of Life. It released in 1981, and there's never been another book like it. Look, kitty, a man of letters. <laughs> When I was a broke college student, I remember me and my friends circling a printer to make copies of someone who had first-generation photocopies from this book. None of us could afford the actual book, and the college's library didn't even bother to have it on a shelf, seeing as how it would immediately be stolen. I still have those photocopies today, in spite of having eventually bought this heavy tome, and I actually used those old photocopies to help create the Diz Fair's animated logo. 
Anyway, the book contains the 12 principles of animation, and it was used to preserve the techniques and knowledge developed at Disney Studios during animation's golden age. It's chock full of all kinds of incredible animation info. Resources, color, theory, you name it. They interviewed all kinds of animators to collect as much great information as possible. Every exceptional animator at Disney was consulted, with the exception of Milt Kahl, as I said, who had decided he'd had enough of Ollie. So Milt refused to be interviewed, and because he never wrote a book himself, never quite fully passed on the animation knowledge he'd accumulated over his years. Nonetheless, the book is astounding. I could go on about the illusion of life for an hour, so I'm going to move on before this evolves into a rant. All aboard. Let's go. And it's impossible to discuss Ellie Johnston without also mentioning his fascination with trains. In fact, if you ever want to discuss the history of Disney and trains for more than about five minutes, you'll inevitably run into Ollie's name. He may have actually been a bigger locomotive enthusiast than Walt Disney, but that's perfectly debatable. Okay, so get this. Around the time of production of Cinderella in 1949, Ollie built a one-inch scale railroad in his backyard, complete with three 112 scale locomotives. You may be wondering what trains have to do with Cinderella. And the answer is nothing, but stay with me here. Walt hears about this, and the very next morning he shows up at Ollie's door unannounced to see this railroad and train. This then inspired Walt to create his own and more famous backyard railroad, the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad. So in essence, Ollie and his one-inch scale backyard railroad is responsible for the eventual railroad at Disneyland and subsequently the Magic Kingdom. Ollie Johnston was also, incidentally, the founding governor of the Carrollwood Pacific Historical Society, along with Ward Kimball, another of Walt's nine old men who hasn't been mentioned yet in this episode. But the legend of Ollie, Disney, and trains doesn't end here. In the 60s, over the course of two years, Ollie restored a full-size narrow-gauge Porter steam locomotive in his driveway. He named it Mary E. after his wife. It even once ran for an event at Disneyland in 2005 the only time a train not owned by Disney ran on Disney property. And in an even weirder turn of events, the Mary E was later purchased by one of Ollie's fans, a certain John Lasseter, the director of Toy Story, Toy Story 2, A Bug's Life, Cars, etc. He's a big name with an extensive list of other accomplishments. Welcome to my train library. Though retired, Ollie never fully exited out of the animation limelight. He was a voice in The Incredibles. No school like the old school as well as a conductor in the Iron Giant. Go on, tell him what you saw, Frank. And despite being retired animators, both Frank and Ollie did everything they could to inspire the next generation. They met computer animation with great interest, wishing they were younger so they could take part in it. When the technology of how it was done was explained to Ollie, he imparted that the principles of animation were exactly the same, whether it be 2D or 3D, and he was absolutely right. But whether it be time restraints, management decisions, or lack of proper excitement or education, I don't believe computer animators today strictly adhere to his or traditional animators' ideals, at least partly due to the fact that Disney talent isn't as properly respected by management as they once were. The movements of characters in the midst of this current animation era is at times awesome, but it isn't exactly unique, personalized, or thoughtfully executed. As a whole, I'm speaking in generalities. It's still good but there's a certain similar smoothness and quickness that permeates through everything that it just feels like it's all cut from the same cloth. But I mean, the not-so-newer Mickey Mouse cartoons were fun and inventive, and every now and again you get a feature that keeps the torch burning, but characters and features as a whole don't have their own life and style, their own liquidity and fluidness, but thankfully, you know, some do. And this may be because of Ollie and Frank's lectures to places even outside of Disney. They spoke to studios like DreamWorks, Blue Sky, and many others. They traveled the globe to share their wisdom. Nevertheless, you're far less likely today to find an erratic Cruella, or the screen time given for a patient villain like Maleficent to simply walk to land the weight of the character's intensity. Even in the 90s, I recall trying to find reference for a bipedal, three-joint-legged character like Beast. But there's not a single full-frame walk cycle in the entire film. And that was a good example of more modern 2D animation. But let me dial myself down and get back to Ollie. He became a Disney legend in 1989, which isn't at all surprising given that all nine of Walt's nine old men were made legends in 1989, but it's still a significant achievement. In this none-too-pleased looking picture of Ollie, he was presented with the National Medal of Arts in 2005 presented by George W. and Laura Bush in the Oval Office. And as I said, Frank and Ollie traveled around the world together, giving lectures and continued writing books right up until Frank Thomas's death in 2004. Not too long after, in 2005, Ollie's wife passed away, 
And finally, Ali himself in 2008, at the age of 95. He was the last of Walt's nine old men to pass away. Ali Johnston, unlike Walt's other eight old men, animated wholly from the heart, centered on feelings. He wasn't the most analytical, but he did have the talent to present the strongest use of emotion of any Disney animator. He wasn't flashy, he was subtle. He wasn't extreme, he was warm. He wasn't edgy, he was sincere. And the result was a lasting set of work that has a life unto itself. His legacy for animators is to always ask, what is the character feeling and why are they feeling that way? He always said, you don't animate drawings, you animate feelings. That was Ollie Johnston, the third of Walt's nine old men. Biz Fair's out.